Welcome to Breakpoint This Week. I'm Shane Morris, here once again with John Stone Street, who's back, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. I'm coming to you from the divinely blessed land we call Florida, which just became the launching point for America's latest mission to Mars, and also just banned iguanas as pets. So it's a... It's really? A what was the reasoning be. behind that? Why, why ban iguanas as yeah, pets? Yeah, because they're, that... they're, because they're an invasive species and they've taken over South Florida. And then in the winter, when it gets cold, they drop out of the trees because they can't hang on anymore and they litter the ground. So I guess the-, the Well, thing... that's actually cool. Like that's, that's one thing I don't <laughs> think we want to remove from the American experience. Given, given all the things that we've gone through in 2020, I mean, the least we can have is frozen falling iguanas frozen falling from trees. Iguanas I mean, that's, winter. that's like a highlight every year. It's like the first snow in Colorado is, <laughs> you know, the falling iguanas. Exactly. They're actually, I was on a plane today. It was so weird. Um, the lady across from me, and, and flying is bizarre. So for anyone who hasn't flown during the pandemic, and this was my first flight, uh, since March for, for the, the, this trip, my family and I just uh, went on, uh, two, two weeks away, spent some time in northern Michigan, spent some time with family in Virginia, had some meetings, but uh, flying's weird. It's just bizarre. Um, but the lady beside me was watching iguana videos. So, I mean, just tonight, just as we were flying back in. So what, what a strange coincidence that you bring up iguanas and the lady beside me is watching iguana videos. I have no idea why, for the record, she just was. She's from Florida. She's uh, bidding adieu to the venerable era of iguanas as pets. Well, maybe she has them as pets and maybe, maybe, so. maybe she was having kind of a moment of silence. They're her scale um, babies. Scats. That are fur babies. That are fur babies. babies. Right, right. Oh, wow. Well, John, the, fir we can... the first story, we, can, we could talk about iguanas here all day, but the first story I think we, we ought to get to this week, um, uh, it comes out of uh, New York, Greater New York, uh, which the Planned Parenthood branch there actually removed, amazingly, uh, the name of the organization's founder, Margaret Sanger, who many of our listeners will uh, know about, uh, from its clinic, and they also petition the city to rename a local street known as Margaret Sanger Square. Um, this is because Margaret Sanger had very unsavory eugenicist and potentially race, uh, racialist views that have now come under fire in uh, modern cancel culture. And you, you did a break point about this earlier this week, and I loved what you said because it got right to the heart of the issue. Instead of focusing on you know, the dark legacy of Margaret Sanger herself, it focused on the modern reality of Planned Parenthood and what it is and what it does and why this is an, this is putting pig, uh, lipstick on a pig. Well, look, it, we, we've had a debate in America over whether there's such a thing as structural racism. Hmm. Uh, this is, d d Planned Parenthood itself is, is proof that there is such a thing as structural racism. In other words, there were some views of the founder and of course, we have to define what we mean by by racist. If we mean, you know, cognitively disdainful of African Americans, uh, I, I think the jury's still out on whether Margaret Sanger had that sort of kind of KKK view. Although she did uh, speak for white supremacist groups, uh, as I understand it. But what we do know is that she held views uh, that were basically an extension of, of Darwinism into the human you know, the human project. And in that respect, she was very, very ordinary for her time. I mean, eugenics was just in the water people swam in, in her era. Right. I mean, we often say this, right? If Darwin had stayed in biology, it wouldn't have been that bad. But Sanger is proof that Darwin jumped biology into anthropology and social policies. And, you know, this is what she advocated. And in fact, many people don't even know that Margaret Sanger wasn't even a big fan of abortion. She thought right. it was a little bit barbaric. She wanted to solve the problem way before that by uh, forced sterilizations. And so one of the things that she uh, promoted in addition to birth control uh, was this idea of uh, sterilization of the unfit. And of course we have some legendary things that came out of the Supreme Court, uh, Buck versus Bell, for example, where uh, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice said, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, you know, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Speaking of an African-American uh, woman whose mother and grandmother had not uh, had a particularly high IQ. So based on the IQ, he uh, basically ruled, uh, the, the court ruled, and he wrote the opinion uh, that the state of Virginia 
uh, could forcibly sterilize this woman. Now, this is all part of the eugenics project. So when we talk about the eugenics project, this is what we're talking about. And if people want to read more on this, there's a couple places you can go. There is a uh, documentary called Mafia 21 that has been on uh, YouTube and other places for quite some time. I also, uh, and this is a source that I quoted uh, extensively in the breakpoint uh, on this topic this past week, uh, a book by Jonah Goldberg called Liberal Fascism. And by the way, if you've never seen that book, you just got to Google it just so you can see the cover. It's got one of the coolest covers. It's got one of those yellow smiley it's a Walmart faces. smiley face with a little Hitler mustache. With a little Hitler mustache. Yeah, it's really a, it's really a remarkable thing. Not, 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 not a trigger at all. So, um, but, but, but what he talks about there is just this kind of deep history. Now, what, what I also want to do, uh, Shane, is make sure that we link our listeners uh, to a presentation uh, and a description uh, that my friend Angela Franks gave, uh, Dr. Angela Franks. I call her a friend. We're colleagues as part of Evangelicals and Catholics together. Uh, she's a Catholic theologian uh, and a remarkable thinker and probably the one that I know of uh, uh, who is the expert that I know of on Margaret Sanger and her legacy. And she draws mm -hmm. that distinction between kind of being consciously racist and being a eugenicist. Now, obviously, eugenics, though, is a form of structural racism. It's basically an intent to create racial disparity on a structural level. Uh, so we have done a lot of things here over the last couple of weeks on why there is such a thing as structural racism. That's not mm -hmm. the same thing as saying that it's everything that people say structural racism is. That's the distinction we've made pretty carefully. But this is an example of that because as we cited, and the stats here are stunning, uh, this initial vision that Sanger had in something called the Negro Project, where literally African-American pastors were paid 100 bucks per sermon to preach birth control and sterilization to African-American uh, congregations because she deemed them among the unfit, as well as other racial uh, ethnic minorities, as well as other impoverished people. She also saw pover poverty, by the way, Shane, as being a product of one's... Um, Basically, bad DNA, breeding. bad breeding. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, to sum all this up, and this is, I think, really important, the stats are still stunning. Planned Parenthood targets ethnic minority neighborhoods. And the results are uh, a population that's, I think, about 13% of the U.S. population, African Americans, have 40% of the abortions. Yes. And it's, they're, they're marketed to, right? It, it, it's a marketing thing. Uh, in terms of both access to facilities a, a, as well as a number of other things. And that's what we mean by structural racism. I don't know that there's a better example, Shane, of structural racism in America than Planned Parenthood. Yeah, and Margaret Sanger's organization has these practically racist outcomes. And that's that's why you're making the charge of structural racism. And I think it's a good charge. The um, the 40 percent statistic is, is absolutely damning for for Planned Parenthood. They are um, for what for the you know all the different reasons that Planned Parenthood executives and leaders uh, believe they're doing this, whether it's to help women, to liberate them from the oppression of the home or, or of continual childbearing, or, or, or however they express it. The practical result is that they're killing off um, an enormous percentage of the, the next generation of black children. And that is as classically structurally racist as I can imagine. You're depriving a whole generation of existence in the name of uh, of helping these communities, but they're not. They're preying on these communities. And I know it's a supply and demand thing, but let's not forget what the, what Planned Parenthood is a merchant of. They're a merchant of murder. Their primary business model is based on something that Sanger admittedly viewed as distasteful, which is, uh, which is abortion. And they, they'll claim that there's all kinds of other things they do. Um, and uh, it's just not true. It's been debunked again and again. Abortion is the flagship product of Planned Parenthood. It's it's the it's yeah. It's butter. the financial. It's the financial driver. There's no question yeah. about it. And so, but but the other thing too to think about, and I, I want to say this really carefully because you brought up the idea of outcome or outputs mm -hmm. of the organization. If we look at that, um, the greater danger to the African American community by far, uh, more than the KKK, more than white supremacy. Even though we've seen this kind of alarm across the board. If you look at outcomes in terms of the long-term impact on the African-American community, those organizations, all of them together, don't come close to Planned Parenthood's uh, destruction of that community and uh, on a number of levels. And I, and I, and I think that that's a very, really hard thing to say. That's the sort of thing you get canceled for. 
mm-hmm. you know, kind of for saying out loud, but, but you start doing the stats and it's done. Now I'm not talking about intent. I'm not talking about there is an intent going into it. Like there's a hatred that one feels uh, because they work at Planned Parenthood for ethnic minorities. Like there is a hatred that legitimately exists among members of the alt-right community, uh, the, the KKK, all, you know, different forms of white supremacy groups. But this goes, uh, underscores something that we think it's important for people to understand about worldview. Ideas have consequences, bad ideas have victims. Ideas have consequences. Intentions don't always have consequences. Sometimes they do. Ideas always have consequences. Ideas grab those, you know, grow feed and walk into the world. And so it's these ideas about what gives life value, about uh, that the ideas that shape Margaret Sanger's work that then was structurally embedded into her, her, her uh, organization. All this stuff is the, the ideas that have the sort of consequences and the sort of victims that we see. And the central idea at work in Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry as a whole, John, is that uh, women need liberating from their reproductive capacity and that children are what's holding them back. And you see it all throughout um, Sanger's movement in the, in the early days. And that's one of the things that's actually much more troubling to me than the fact that she attended, you know, one uh, women's KKK rally of some sort and, and was sort of uncomfortable and awkward about it. I'm much more concerned about the fact that she thought, A, <clears> that we should be eliminating unfit people from society through selective breeding, and B, that, uh, that women should be liberated from their, the shackles of their, their natural bondage to childbearing. Yeah. And that, of course, with that is the attendant view, views of the family and all that's come with Planned Parenthood. Now, I'll tell you what, John, I think uh, Margaret Sanger, I have no wish to defend Margaret Sanger, but I will say that I, I, the, some of the stuff I've heard from more recent Planned Parenthood executives and presidents has been more ghoulish than anything I've ever read from Margaret Sanger, because it's an open and bold celebration of abortion in a way that she never really did. That she didn't want to do. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about the Center for Medical Progress videos. But what you brought up just a second ago is worth, uh, I think, reiterating, and that is that on both of those levels, the the views of that, that certain segments of the population shouldn't reproduce and that women should be separated from their reproductive capacity. uh, These get to the heart of two questions that Chuck Colson used to talk about were kind of indicative of, uh, or maybe the best questions to really get to the heart of worldviews. And that's what's wrong with the world and what's the solution, right? So think about that. What's wrong with the world are complete segments of the population. That was inherent to the eugenics movement. What's wrong with the world is a woman's reproductive system. In other words, it's not a good part of her, uh, of her design. It's a complete rejection of creation. It's a problem that needs to be solved. I, I, Angela Franks talks about this. Dr. Franks talks about this in such, uh, I think, brilliant ways uh, that, that basically that this whole movement sees um, the life-giving capacity that God gave women. Uh, it's wrong to define them down to just that, but to see that as the problem that needs to be solved is a just a dramatically uh, dangerous reading of the world. And so then, you know, that also informs the solution. And I, I think that's, those are two very important points you brought up, Shane, that, that, that can help people really understand this. And again, we can, we, we can, we can stop being fixated on this kind of this language of, you know, hatred or being mean as being the only thing that makes somebody wrong. Like the, the ideas themselves can have the greatest and purest and best intentions and be just devastatingly bad. And what we've seen, by the way, is that Planned Parenthood execs have other intentions, like to get Lamborghinis. <laughs> Referring again back to the Center for Medical Progress videos from David Daladin. Well, uh, you're listening to Breakpoint this week. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this to talk about more of the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. Stay with us. We're back on Breakpoint this week, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, there was a sad, uh, a very sad story this week that I think hit uh, very close to home for you. Um, and it was summarized best, I think, in an article by a friend of mine, Esther O'Reilly, at uh, the American Conservative. And, and she wrote about the death of Mike Adams. Uh, I want to let you talk about this for a second, because you're much closer to, you were much closer to him than I was. You knew much more about him. And um, and I want our listeners to sort of understand the situation because there's a lot to talk about here uh, in the wake of of his death. You know, one of the things that struck me when Shane Chuck Colson died is how I, I think it was the Washington Post made sure that everyone remembered that um, he was Nixon's hatchet man. And many people thought his conversion was a, a jail 
a jailhouse conversion. Now, that was 35 years after this whole thing happened. That was 35 years of a track record. And, 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 it, and it bothered me, not just because, you know, you, we, we knew and loved Chuck personally. It bothered me because that's not who he is. And to say that's who he is is just patently absurd. Right. Um, the, uh, one of the hardest parts of this past week for me has been the, the narrative about Dr. Mike Adams that has been allowed to go forward from CNN to BuzzFeed to everyone else. Give our listeners an idea of who Mike Adams was. I, I, I am. I, I, want, I want people to, uh, to get the, 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 the setup. So, okay. so Mike was a, uh, a very good friend um, over uh, 10 years ago when uh, I was working at Summit Ministries. I reached out to bring Mike out to speak. At the time, he was writing for Town Hall, and he had become – uh, well-known because of a lawsuit that he was embroiled in. And David French actually was the lawyer for Mike Adams in a lawsuit that had was just getting started that ended up going for seven years, which had to do with him being a denied promotion. Now, it, he, he, he's one of those uh, interesting stories. There's another one, uh, a guy named Jay Buczyszewski, who's a wonderful natural law scholar. And, and Dr. Buczyszewski got hired when he was a nihilist, uh, as a philosopher and then became a Christian and they don't know what to do with him now. So he got hired because of a dissertation that said something like there was no such thing as good and evil. And now he's one of the foremost advocates of natural law. You know, that good and evil is written on the human heart. Mike's story is not unlike that where Mike was hired as an atheist. He was a skeptic and it was a prisoner when he had visited, he's a criminologist and it was a prisoner that he visited uh, in a prison down in South America. And he was challenged about reading the Bible. His mom prayed for him a lot. Uh, he was pushed to read Born Again. Chuck's work in the prison actually drew, was one of, the, one of the, the many things. There was a number of things that finally drew Mike Adams to cry. So as a, as a professor on a tenure track at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, having been hired as an atheist, secularist, leftist, now you have a very articulate, thoughtful, um, and very... Uh, uh, what, what do we want to say, uh, in your face sort of uh, thinker and writer and became particularly passionate about the unborn and became a, just a radically uh, courageous defender of the unborn, but also an advocate for Christianity. He won several Teacher of the Year awards at UNC Wilmington before and after his conversion because he was a remarkable teacher. And that was something that I saw in person at Summit Ministries as he and I grew in our friendship and we both taught there year after year. Mike started to just come out and, and live in the summers in Colorado. And uh, just a, a, it, it was like a respite for him. I, I asked him, um, because as the story goes, he was denied promotion. promotion. There was a, a lawsuit. It became one of the most important campus religious freedom cases of our lifetime. And uh, Mike uh, won a significant amount of money and, and uh, lawyers fees and so on and back pay and everything else from the University of North Carolina uh, system. Well, I was uh, on vacation last week and uh, got a text from a mutual friend with an article uh, with some really bad news and called some friends. And, and um, during early in quarantine, uh, Mike, who was a opponent of the, the lockdown, particularly the way it was being done in North Carolina, uh, tweeted out a couple things. One, one was deemed racist. And I'd say it was insensitive. It's not something that I would write, certainly not something I would say was a good idea, but, I, you know, it, it, he was deemed racist. It seemed like one of those heat of the, the moment sort of things. I, you know, it's Mike. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say a boys will be boys sort of thing, but, there, you know, he was making a point. The other one was actually funny and it was deemed misogynist, but that was just actually funny. Uh, and, you know, and there's other things, but uh, the university decided that was the end of their relationship. Because, but because Mike had won so much money off him the last time, they were really frightened to do anything other than settle with him. But I, and I talked to Mike about a month ago, and, and he was in the midst of the negotiations, and it was hard. And then we texted back and forth a few weeks later, and he said he got a good settlement. But as my friends would tell me, our mutual friends, something happened with Mike, um, and um, I'm not sure, uh, he, but last week, Mike took his own life.
Um, I think about it on a number of levels, Shane. It's, it's hard. It's sad. It's brutal. He was in a brutal business and he felt it. I know he felt it because we spent a lot of time. He spent week after week after week at my home during the summer. My kids called him Uncle Mike. My daughters, as we were sitting there looking at Lake Michigan last week, and I broke the news to them. They just cried and cried and cried. It was just really, really hard. Um, they knew him for 10 years. And, um, you know, my oldest is 15. So, you know, that's just way more than their, than, than their you know, their, um, the, the vast majority of their life. Okay. I, I bring this up, Shane, because there's a m million angles on this. First of all, I want to give Mike honor. I want to say that I'm sad that people are going to know him for a narrative that's not true about Mike. Um, when George Floyd was killed, Mike was one of the first people to talk about the unjust actions of the police officers. Hmm. Um, Mike was an advocate for the African American community on the issue of abortion on a lot of other issues. Uh, Mike was uh, a champion of, of women. I know that because of how he encouraged and talked to my wife and treated her like a human being and loved on my kids. I, I, I'm just sad that that's the Mike that people will know. They'll know him, the, the, the Twitter Mike or the, the Twitter version of the Twitter Mike. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but what everyone accuses him of. But he was a kind, loving, big-hearted guy. And, and I also, we've talked about these kind of, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the deaths of despair. And, you know, you kind of look back and you're like, who, who's the unthinkable one here? And Mike was one of those for me. It's just hard for me to fathom. It doesn't make sense to me. Mike's future was, uh, you know, he, he, he would have been great. Um, he had a lot more to say and a lot more books to write and thousands more students to mentor. And I, I'm just gutted over the whole thing. I also know that if it weren't for COVID, he would have taught last fall. He would be teaching this spring, and he would have spent the summer out at Summit Ministries, and at, and you know, and uh, once a week over at my house and with my kids. And and I just don't think this would have been the same outcome. You know what I mean? And yeah, we talked was, about that was one of the things that Esther actually reflected on in her piece, where she said that uh, Mike was a man who thrived on being in person and having real interactions with people face to face and that it must have been debilitating for him to be stuck at home constantly. I mean, not that it, not that he's unique in that respect. There are so many people in the country who are feeling that right now. Um, but he, he is uniquely known at this point as a, uh, as a casualty of that. And also as a casualty of well, part of her reflection was on um, the viciousness of the smear campaign and the cancel culture that came down on him uh, in all of these incidents that you're talking about. But even after his news came out of his death, the, uh, the just sort of fixation on these tweets that were deemed problematic and now are the entire story of his life for many people. And Esther wrote uh, about her friend just to you know, clear the air for, for any readers who, who happened to catch her angle that, look, this was a good man and someone who impacted countless lives for Christ. And, uh, and it's unjust that he should be remembered the way he's being uh, remembered in the, the mainstream media right now. And so that's a, that's a worthy point right there to make, I think. And it, it, it reminds me, John, of the fact that, um, you know, on a deeper level, we're all just human. We need to try to remember that at the end of the day, that we're not, you know, we're not handles on Twitter. We're not profile pictures on Facebook. We all have pain and sorrow and, uh, and words hurled at us yeah. like that that are untrue. I mean, they hurt. We, we can go back to James. We can go back to all the passages in Scripture about the tongue. But at, at the end of the day, we are, there, there are real people at the end of those, uh, you know, those handles. There are real people behind those names. And um, the kind of stuff we say about each other, whether it's in public, uh, publications or just on social media, has a real impact. And we'll never know this side of eternity what role that kind of bullying and harassment played um, for Mike. But we, we do know that, uh, that it does impact thousands of people every year, and it's, it's devastating. And I, I love Esther's reflection. We'll link to that at, uh, in the show notes at breakpoint.org. 
Yeah, I, well, I, I thought she did a nice job, and, and she their connection started at Summit Ministries, I think, and um, as well, and, and that was the, the kind of the history. Michelle Malkin actually wrote a, a, a really nice piece. They were both fr- fans of what's called the incline, which is a, re- a ridiculously hard hike here. Uh, just outside I've done of it. Manitou. I've done it. The giant You've staircase the with the, uh, yeah. the ratchet railroad that went up the mountain in Manitou Springs, yeah. Yeah, Mike would 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 come out and start doing that right away, and and so on. But it, it, you know, I, I th- that that's all of that is 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 right. M- Mike had remarkably thick skin, uh, but he was human, and some something just um, so, something that doesn't make sense to me right now. Maybe will never make sense. Um, it, you know, happen. I, I will say that. A whole lot of us, uh, his good friends, um, have spent an awful lot of time this week checking on each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's maybe in something we could say is that, look, I don't want to take for granted that people are okay. Um, and b- because so- so- sometimes they're not. I mean, they're just really not. And there was so much about Mike's future that we had talked about just even in the last couple weeks uh, in the last couple months I you know the last time I saw Mike uh, my wife and I were at a uh, the, the gala for live action with Lila Rose Lila wrote a very touching tribute to Mike too on Twitter and um, you know he was talking about all kinds three or four different aspects of his future and it's just hard where how does someone go from talking about that uh, to losing that sort of hope um, and, 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 it, and, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense, uh, but it's a brutal, it's a brutal place to do the sort of thing that Mike did. And, you know, there's a lot of people that'll talk badly about some of the things that Mike did, and I may not have agreed with everything, but he's one of those guys that if he did not have the courage to stand up in all the ways and all the places that he did, uh, the, we, we'd be a lot further uh, away uh, from religious freedom right now, particularly on campus. Mm. Uh, he inspired students to be pro-life on campus and stand up for that. He inspired other professors. Uh, he even inspired professors, uh, you know, who, uh, you, you know, would then go on and 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 be way more outspoken on things that were true and good. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mike uh, accomplished a lot, and he touched a lot of people. And um, yeah, he'll, he'll be deeply missed. I want to honor him and his legacy which lives on in a whole lot of, uh, of his students that he worked with and mentored. I will say this, Shane, one of the interesting things is as much as people celebrated his death and it was awful. I told my daughters that they, they weren't allowed to, to look him, to look up this story and to get anywhere near it on Twitter or Facebook or anything because it just got so wicked. But I, but I will say this on the tribute page uh, for Mike, I just read through that earlier this evening and there are so many students who said, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal. I'm not a conservative like Mike, but he was a good man. He was a good professor. He treated my views as if they mattered. He took me seriously. And he wasn't what everyone is saying. Uh, one reflection in particular, uh, a girl who ended up disagreeing with Mike. I think she said she was a feminist and a secularist. But he counseled her through a career change, a major change, and how valuable he was. And that's just what, you know, he, the sort of guy he, he, he was. So he'll, he'll be missed. I pray that he rests in peace. I pray peace over his friends. Uh, a lot of them were in the battle with him. And, you know, there's something about that when you're on stage with a guy or you're taking, you know, heat with a guy. It, it, it just brings you closer. And I know they're hurting deeply right now as, as his brother and some of his other family members. So. I appreciate the opportunity here, Shane, just to talk about him. I just felt like I wanted to and I needed to, and and, and there's just too much to say. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take one more quick break. We'll be right back after this to talk about more of the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. Stay with us. We're back on Breakpoint this week, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, there's one more story I wanted to get to this week that was uh, just all over my little corner of social media and it was, uh, it was about a pastor that's very influential in American evangelicalism, particularly for those of us who identify as uh, you know, more uh, Calvinist bent. John MacArthur actually uh, made the decision uh, this past Sunday to keep his church there open in California, uh, and, and that they announced that they will continue to meet in person in defiance of a state-mandated ban on church services and other such gatherings. 
And uh, his rationale was that Christ, not the state, is the head of the church. And he said, I can't think of anything worse than to put an entire world into fear and then shut down the only place they could go to have their fear finally and completely removed. Uh, and so this is sparking a conversation about what, at what point does a government edict become uh, an edict that we disobey God? And at what point do we have to, as, as lay people, as pastors, as uh, church elders, what have you, repeat Peter's words from Acts, you know, shall we obey man rather than God? No, we will, uh, we'll of course obey God. Where's that line? And that's, that's the, the interesting thing about this conversation. I think John, what, one thing I said um, when I posted the story was that uh, California was really asking for this. I mean, this was a stupid move to try to indefinitely shut down churches. There's already a lot of, a lot of tension in this area because churches have been um, just dragged through this and the whole, and it's not, you know, this is something we all have to go through together, but, uh, churches have been especially hard hit by this because they've been, as you've said before, too often identified as uh, a non-essential service, something that we don't really need. Well, California, not a surprise because it's a very liberal state deemed churches were indefinitely non-essential. There's something we can just live without, uh, into the, uh, indefinite future, like sports for, in for instance. And, and that's um, that is a really bad idea. <laughs> I think it's a foolish thing to say for all kinds of reasons. Um, first of all, because churches should not be singled out. The same rules ought to apply to everyone. And I don't think that the California uh, rule does apply equally. I think there's a, there's a good argument to be made that churches are being singled out under this uh, particular edict. I think it's also possible that um, there could be a scenario in which something like this could be justified, but I'm definitely not convinced this is it. I'm definitely not convinced we can't have, you know, responsible social distancing. We can't wear masks. We can't, we cannot do all that and come to church together and still um, worship as a body. And that really comes back to the point of the lack of value placed on churches by, by government officials. I'm very, very grateful for my own officials here in Florida. I know many states have, uh, have done a great job on this compared to California because they've prioritized churches as something that, that, that people desperately need um, always, but especially right now. And so I'm, I'm glad to see that sort of thing uh, prioritized elsewhere. But MacArthur is right now the figurehead of this, uh, of this resistance against unfair government edicts that would uh, shut down God's people. Yeah. So, so three hours ago, I was in the Denver airport and the only way to get from concourse B to where I flew into and, and uh, apparently a bunch of planes all at the same time and back to baggage claim was to get on, you know, is to get on the train and on the train, uh, it was absolutely packed. It was absolutely packed uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, for three stops on the train. Um, there is absolutely no way. Uh, and and that, that, of course, is probably eight or nine, ten planes coming in from different parts of the country all at once. People all getting off who don't know each other into a train that probably hasn't been cleaned all day. Maybe it has, but it doesn't matter. There's no way. There's literally no way that that meets any sort of, uh, you know, best practice scenario for treating this. And, and we look around the country and we look around uh, different industries and different places and we see that, look, we're, we're back to life in so many different ways mm -hmm. and in ways that which we're kind of, you know, playing by the letter of the law, like everyone has a face covering on because it's the rule in Denver, but most people have it below their nose. Some people have it on their chin, you know, as if it's holding their lips in place. I mean, look, th this, th this is not, to, to, to then turn around where all of this is a reality and say churches can't meet. It, it doesn't make sense. And we've hit that point where it just doesn't make sense. Uh, this is why, you know, the Supreme Court's decision about a week ago to not take the case of churches in Nevada, where, you know, apparently uh, you can go to the casino, but you can't go to the church, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how does this make any sense whatsoever? 
you can go to the casino and play a number of games, but you can't actually go to church. Yeah, I was just looking uh, up the rules in California for bars as well, and it appears they're much more uh, liberal with the bars than they are with the uh, Well, in California, is a big state. What, what's happening in LA is not even what's happening in Orange County, much less Northern California, much less anywhere else. And I think Sun Valley, I don't, I don't know California geography, but I do know that one of the problems that we're having is that there, it, 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 when crises like this happen, people punt to their worldview, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a worldview which says power, uh, state power is the answer to the problems that, that we have. And you can see that even if you don't have this sort of like uh, 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 evil intent against churches or the disdain for churches, like we heard out of, you know, Bloomberg, uh, Mayor Bloomberg and other places uh, and other sources during this, uh, you know, lockdown, you still see this gut level reaction, which attempts to take uh, a, a, a nationwide solution and force it down uh, on local levels. And, and that's what I've appreciated. Uh, what I have appreciated about Colorado, and it hasn't been nearly as loose as Florida, but what I've appreciated about it is that there has been at least a recognition that Denver is not Gunnison. Right. In other words, that the, these are very, very different parts, even of the state. And, and we need to allow local responses on the ground. And I think at some level, MacArthur is responding to that as well. Uh, you know, where are the breakouts and, and what is the nature of the breakouts? And let's stop kind of moving the uh, the goalpost on terms of are we flattening the curve? Are we keeping the you know, the, the you know, uh, are we waiting for a vaccine? Are we keeping uh, emergency rooms from being overrun? We're just at a point where people, I think, have about had enough on it, and and and, and it's just getting frustrating. Now, look, I also the, the probably the issue that I had with the way uh, Pastor MacArthur, and it's it's it, 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 the, the kind of the definitiveness of the language. It kind of gives the impression that if your pastor is not also standing up yeah, like right, this. Right, right. Then, then he's bowing to the state. And I think, again, the situation on the ground, I don't know the situation on the ground mm -hmm. in Sun Valley, California, or with the congregation at Grace Community Church. I do know, I've talked to a, you know, half a dozen CEOs of large corporations in the last three months who haven't had a single case in their whole workforce, right? So it just is not the same from one, in, you know, from one place to the other. I, you know, I also know of a church in Colorado Springs where the pastor is dealing with a vast majority of the population that's elderly and that actually lives in retirement uh, sorts of homes. And, you know, they're at very high risk and that's not okay either to put them at high risk. And so I, I would say that, you know, this isn't a thus saith the Lord moment uh, for Pastor MacArthur that everyone now needs to go back or they're, you know, kowtowing to the state and bowing, uh, you know, to Caesar uh, but I also think, too, that we warned at the very beginning, and many did, that in situations like this, you punt to your worldview. And the worldview here is that the state wins. The state is the one that makes the decisions. The state is the one that gets to make the call. And that the state will have a tendency to overstep its bounds. And I think we've seen it in Nevada. It was stunning that John Roberts sided with the, the majority uh, on not taking that case. Uh, and we'll link to some details on that as well in the show notes. Uh, but uh, look, it, I, I just, it kind of seems like we're at some level of a tipping point here. And he is, well, you said it, he's the new leader. He now leads the, he now he leads the resistance. What's, you know, he, he is the, uh, you know, the Katniss Everdeen of America. So there you go. <laughs> whoever, whoever called John MacArthur Katniss Everdeen before, I, I think I win. We'll let you have that one, John. Well, folks, we're out of time for today. Uh, come to breakpoint.org for links to all the stories that we've mentioned today on the program, as well as daily worldview commentary and resources to help you live out your Christian calling in this time and culture. For the Colson Center and for John Stone Street, I'm Shane Morris. Thanks so much for listening.